Good morning, everybody. It's second service on this Sunday. And I'm really glad you guys are here. By the way, I don't need you. I want you, but I don't need you. I'm glad you're here. By the way, you don't need me. You don't need me. Now, I am grateful to be your pastor. I've never been any time in my life without a pastor. So I'm old enough to have five pastors. And you say, what happened to the five pastors? Well, three of them died. And one retired. And today I have, and I, I love my pastor today. Love him. But I don't need him. You guys are afraid to say amen. amen. <laughs> no, don't misunderstand. I want you here, and I'm grateful I get to be your pastor. But you don't need me. You say, what do I need? Yeah, you need you need the Lord Jesus. And you might say, well, I'm glad I have my Bible. Well, I'm glad you have a Bible too. Matter of fact, that's actually a miracle that you have a Bible. You, you have a copy of the Word that was breathed by God. You guys got a copy? Do you know how blessed you are to have a copy of the Word of God? Amen. Most Christians have never had a personal copy of the Word of God. I'm talking historically. But that's the wrong question. Really what I should say, well, you got a Bible, right? By the way, if you don't have a Bible, steal one from this church. <laughs> Go ahead, you, you can steal it. I'm not, I'm not joking, steal one. If you don't have a Bible, steal one from, from us. But you'd better read it. Or else you might get fleas. <laughs> See, the, the problem is, is this, if I'm just sharing with you before we open the Bible, it's not that you don't have a Bible, but the problem would be, but does the Bible have you? Amen. And you say, well, the Bible doesn't have me. Well, I understand why the Bible doesn't have you. I actually understand that. Probably because you're reading the Bible the wrong way. Well, how should we read it? Well, most people in most churches in America today read the Bible so that they know how to live their lives. Did you know your Bible wasn't written for you to know how to live your life? Oh, you can find out from your Bible how to do finances and marriage and be a better parent. You can, but that's not why you have a Bible. Did you know that? Well, I thought it was to give me all the instructions so that I could get through life. That's not true. That's not true. Your, your Bible was written to you to be a love letter from God. Amen. That you would that you would fall in love with the one that loves you so much. Amen. He died for you. All that other stuff is extra. And so I'm, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to be a better husband and a parent and a pastor, all that stuff. But that is so secondary. Your Bible was given to you as a love letter from God. Amen. So that you would love God more. Now, here's the problem. That doesn't happen either. Even though what I just said is true, it doesn't happen. There's people in this room right now. There's people online. Glad you guys are online. I'm glad you're here. But if we were really honest, you don't see the Bible as a love letter. You're not more in love with the Lord because somehow 
You know, I read it, and then I read it again. You made us feel so guilty. I even read all the way through it one year. And you send out your tweets, and so, but to be honest, you know, it's still on the coffee table, and I know, and I need to respect it. And we came to church. We tried to find our Bible. Here we are. Would you just get this over so we can get to the Super Bowl? <laughs> We're trying to be good Christians. We're trying to pretend, and here we are. What, am I telling you the truth? That the letter that was written to you as a love letter? That somehow you're not loving God or receiving it and you're not more in love with God than you were 10 years ago. See, that's the problem with the Bible. Did he just say there's a problem with the Bible? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, there's no mistakes in the Bible. It was breathed by God, every jot and tittle. But here's the problem with the Bible. You'll never understand it. Your brain cannot comprehend what God himself has communicated by itself. You see, if you don't have the Holy Spirit illuminating, enlightening, then the Bible's just another book. You can study it at at Emerald College. Historically, you can look at its poetry. You can look at all its facts and figures. And that would be true. But you won't fall in love with the author Unless the spirit of truth moves on your heart. Oh, it is truth. But if you don't have an interaction with the Holy Spirit, matter of fact, that's all a setup for us because, you know, we're looking at the Holy Spirit in in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. And if you came this morning, well, you're just coming in kind of on the tail end of what happened in the upper room. And the, the Lord Jesus has been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. But then last week we saw in John chapter 16, he actually said these words. He says, it's to your advantage that I leave. It's actually expedient for you that I leave. Matter of fact, it's best for everybody if I just get out of here. And you say, who said that? Jesus said it. Why would Jesus say it's to your advantage that I'm not here? Because he wants to give you the Holy Spirit that brings everything to life. Notice with me, we were there last week. And so I just, I I love this truth. I love this chapter so much. I love that Jesus tells us the truth. John 16, John chapter 16 and verse 7, it's the Lord Jesus. Uh, He's actually making his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's had this long discourse with the 11 disciples, but then he throws down John chapter 16, verse 7. Do you guys have your Bibles open? You're not going to take my word that I'm telling you the word of God straight up, right? I mean, you really want to see it in the Bible. And you say, I didn't bring a Bible. There's one right in front of you. You want to make sure that what I tell you is actually the words of Jesus. But then you're still not going to get it. By the way, you're not going to get it. It won't make a big impression in your life unless the Holy Spirit blesses you. So that's what we're going to pray for in just a moment. Is that okay? You guys look like I've already scared you. Let me see if I can back this up, train up a little bit. How to unscare the people I just scared because they think I just said your Bible's not going to work without the Holy Spirit. Your Bible's not going to work without the Holy Spirit. But don't be scared. That's why Jesus said, I got to go to your advantage because I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. In other words, when I give you the Holy Spirit, then your Bible will work. You say, what does that mean? Well, it's kind of like Moses in the tent. That was not the tabernacle. That was the tent of meeting. And, And Moses had this profound privilege to meet with God every day. Matter of fact, when he met with God every day, his face would glow. Remember that? But all the other people had to stand in the doorway of their tent and had to look over there at Moses in the tent with God. And God would talk to Moses face to face as with a friend. Nobody else got to do that. Nobody. They just had to stand and watch Mo glow. 
That'd be like if you came to church and you weren't allowed to come in the building. You had to stand outside by your car and that you had to somehow look and see if Bill's glowing. Woo! <laughs> Nobody else comes in. Well, why can't Bill glow? Because he's a friend of God and God meets with him. Do you understand the new covenant? Do you understand the Holy Spirit that all of us get to glow in the dark, so to speak, with God? And that he actually wants to use you as a light so that when you go out there, not to scare anybody, but you go out there into the world and they're going like, what? what's going on? Well, I've been with my friend and I'm glowing. I'm not making that up. That's in the book of Exodus. That's in the book of 1 Corinthians. Moses had a fading glory. We do not have a fading glory. Amen? Matter of fact, we should be glowing more now. And you say, well, I don't feel like I'm glowing. Well, that's because only the Holy Spirit can make you glow. That's why. <laughs> okay. Thank you for, I did. That's extra. Uh, chapter 16, verse 7. The Holy Spirit advantage. That's the sermon title today. And chapter 16, verse 7. Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. It's best for you. It's expedient for you that I go away. What? Yeah, I need to go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Look at verse 14. Jesus said, he will glorify me. The Holy Spirit's going to glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. I really need to leave so that you can have the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to tell you, he'll declare, he'll declare to you my glory. Matter of fact, he's going to tell you what's mine, what's mine, what's mine. That's what the Holy Spirit's going to do. He's going to do that for you so that as you have the information, praise God, we have the information, black and white. I just quoted Jesus to you. But watch this. The information is not the goal. We're not here to get more information. The information with illumination, the information with inspiration of the Holy Spirit in you will mean transformation for you. If you came just wanting information today, well, I'm glad you're here. But you leave with information and no illumination, no inspiration of the Spirit of God, you'll be the same as when you walked in. No glow. But if you get the information from Jesus recorded in your Bible, and then you ask the Holy Spirit to take the information you're about to receive, illuminate your heart and your mind, enlighten you, bring it to life in you, then when you leave, you'll be a little more like Jesus than when you came. Because this whole thing is for you to look and act and be like Jesus. Period. And don't we have a really hard time doing that? So what I need, I need the advantage of the Holy Spirit. Practically. So that the transformation, because of his illumination and inspiration, with his word, his word. By the way, his word is all about him. It has details about marriages and kids and money. It does. But the word of God is about him. And the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son. Because what is his, the Holy Spirit brings and tells us all about the Son. Amen? 
Did you just preach to us the sermon? Well, yeah, in a way I did. But how do we get there? Father, thank you for my friends here today. Thank you for our Bibles today, Lord, that we, we gather together to open this book of life. But we confess, we already know, Lord, experientially, that if it's just words on a page, it takes your spirit to bring these words to life. I pray the same as the inspiration, the breath of God on the apostles that wrote this book. I pray the breath of God on us. Within us, Lord, our brain and our heart to be able to comprehend this love letter from God that you gave to us personally. We got a copy Oh, Lord, help us to read it today with the advantage of the Holy Spirit. And so that with his advantage, we would walk out of here, Lord, more in love with you, glowing with you than when we came. And all of God's people would say, wow, wow, wow. What is this, the Holy Spirit advantage? Well, the Holy Spirit has been with the Lord communicated by the Lord in the upper room all the way since John 14. Turn back with me. The Holy Spirit, the advantage of the Holy Spirit is that you have a, you have a new best friend. Because of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus is leaving, you have a new best friend. I got one amen, and the rest of you, I guess you, guess you guys got enough friends. <laughs> I don't need a new best friend. Well, it depends what your best friend's going to do for you. You say, well, I read the Bible. I don't see best friend anywhere. Well, look at it, what Jesus said in John chapter 14. So Holy Spirit advantage, um, I think you got a new best friend. Chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. But what's this? other helper. I, I don't understand. Well, that's the word paraclete in the Greek. And we saw this about uh, two months ago. And, and we saw that when you have that word paraclete, that, that actually is a reference to the spirit of truth. That's a reference to the Holy Spirit. And in my Bible, this translation, New King James, it calls him helper. So the Holy Spirit is a helper. But if you have a different translation, it might call him the advocate. Coming from the same Greek word, he's a helper, he's an advocate, kind of like a lawyer. Uh, he defends you. But not only only is he a helper or a lawyer, he's also your comforter. And so we understand that's kind of different than being a helper. Oh, but not only is he a comforter, he's a counselor. And so you have all these different words and different translations. Well, why can't anybody get it right? Because they're all right. The Holy Spirit, the paraclete, called alongside of you that Jesus says, I'm going to give to you when I get out of here. He's coming. He's going to be your helper. He's going to be your comforter. He's going to be your counselor. He's going to be your advocate. He's going to be your lawyer. He's going to be your best friend. He said, I didn't, I didn't know I got a best friend. Well, have you ever had one? I don't know about you, but I've had a couple of different best friends in my life. My oldest best friend, by the way, is not Cindy. My oldest best friend is my brother. You say, why? Well, because we've got 64 years together. We used to fight a lot. We don't fight very much anymore because he used to win. But anyways, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. But see, when my best friend Doug, I know what it is to get in trouble. And then I need some help. And so my brother, you know, coming up through life, he would be my helper. Like in a practical way. Like when your dad's trying to kill your mom. And police and guns and blood and demons and all that stuff. We, we went through those stories numerous times. And he was my best friend. My helper. He knew how I felt in junior high. He, he was also my comforter. You say, comforter? Well, yeah, you know, when you have a really bad day and all that kind of stuff, you don't know who to talk to. Well, I call my best friend. And he knew how to comfort. He also knows how to counsel. 
and say, Pastor Bill, you don't need a counselor. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. Because in part of the counseling, he has to also come and defend me. And then he has to find me. And he said, what do you mean find you? Well, because I'm, I'm done. I'm gone. There was at least three times during COVID. I'm out of here. It's over. Where were you? I don't want anybody to know where I am. I'm walking. I'm just going to walk until I can't walk no more. And then my brother comes looking for his crazy brother. Why would he do? He's my best friend. an advocate, a lawyer, somebody stands up for you or can speak into your life. I'm a brother. By the way, my Cindy has all those same relationships and things in my life. But the Lord Jesus comes and says, hey, how about another? Well, Lord, you're all we need. Well, I'm out of here. The Holy Spirit is going to be your new best friend. He'll talk to you when nobody wants to answer your phone calls. Matter of fact, he might keep you awake so he can talk to you while you're trying to sleep. What kind of best friend? That might be the best thing you need. It's the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, okay, it's to your advantage because you, disciples, you, Grace Church, you need a new best friend. Can I hear an amen? Well, what does he do? Well, he abides with you forever that he may, verse 16, that he may abide with you, dwell with you, live with you forever. Well, when's he going to leave? He's never going to leave. Your best friend's never going to leave. Have you ever had a best friend leave on you? I've had that. Not my brother. (laughs) Not my wife. I've had others. Holy Spirit's never going to leave you. Can I hear an amen? Man, I I don't know about this best friend, but I want to know more. Well, then it's the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. By the way, only for believers do you get a new best friend. The world doesn't have it. The world doesn't even know what we're talking about. If you're still in the world, you happen to be here, get saved. You'll understand what we're talking about. Say, I don't know. What are you talking about? The ghost? Well, yeah, he is called the ghost, but he's the spirit of God. He's the spirit of truth. And he's my best friend today. Absolutely my best friend. Well, where'd you get that? Well, this is where it gets not spooky. It just gets personal. Verse 17, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. What? Yeah, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit's your best friend. He's going to abide with you. He's never going to leave you. The world doesn't have him. He's never, ever, he's going to be your counselor, advocate, all those things. And by the way, he's been with you, but he's going to be in you. In me? Like, what do you mean in me? Like, (laughs) in you. Like there's somebody taking up residence in me. Uh Uh-huh. Did he ask permission? No. How do you get in me? You said yes to Jesus. And then without even the information, all of a sudden you are invaded by this body snatcher. Boom! Like, what just happened? And that can look different to different people in experience. But one thing, everybody in this room, everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. If it's happened to you, you know when the Holy Spirit came into you. And then there's other people in this room going like, that guy's whacked out. He's talking about some kind of Ghostbuster something movie. I just wanted to go to church and watch the Super Bowl. Well, that's okay. Except you need the Holy Spirit in you. By the way, I never prayed for the Holy Spirit to come into me, did I? I said yes to Jesus, and he just showed up. <laughs> I was only 16, but I know something's different in here. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit. And he started talking to me. Well, what did he say? He told me a lot. You, everybody here said, bless you. The Holy Spirit said, bless you. <laughs> now, the, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit starts talking. He comes in, but then he starts talking to you. And he starts telling you stuff as your best friend that the best friend needs to tell you. Like for me, the first thing the Holy Spirit ever said to me is, quit cussing. What? I'm only 16. I'm all just around my guys I work with. And the Holy Spirit came and said, no, I mean it. Quit cussing. Well, I didn't even know who's talking. It's just somebody's kicking me right there. What, what is that? What is that? And then he said, quit looking and start. And then it gets down to the fine, you know, like 
drive the speed limit? I am not driving the speed limit. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit comes and says, you want to bet? You want to bet? You want to bet? That never stops. That never stops. So it's one thing. You've got a new best friend. The Holy Spirit was with you. Now the Holy Spirit's going to be in you. It's to your advantage, I leave, because you have no idea about your new best friend and what that means to you practically with your Bible and Jesus. You don't know yet. You don't know yet. But what should we know? The Holy Spirit is your teacher. That's what he says. The Holy Spirit will instruct you and remind you of Christ's teaching. Verse 26. Jesus said, but when the helper, when the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, my character, all of who I am, my glory, we'll see that later in chapter 16, but the, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he, the Holy Spirit, the helper, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you, your best friend is going to be your teacher. And he's going to remind you everything I've been telling you guys for three years. He's going to bring it to your, remem to your memory. But he's going to be the one that teaches you the Holy Spirit. Now you're talking to the apostles. You're talking to the disciples. And we know that the Holy Spirit's going to breathe on them the very words of God right down to the jot and tittle. It's going to be recorded and then preserved for you that you got a copy of it. The truth and nothing but the truth. The truth about what? That's a valid question. The truth about who? See, the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches them and you the truth about Jesus and what Jesus wants you to be. No, I've got a Bible. I've memorized the Bible. I've read through it and trying to keep the Ten Commandments. Well, I'm glad you did that. It doesn't work. You reading your Bible without the Holy Spirit doesn't work. See, I know this really old guy. Well, he's dead. He's that old. He's already dead. And 65 years ago, to the church in America, 65 years Years ago, he said this. The doctrine of the inability of the human mind. The doctrine of the inability of the human mind and the need for divine illumination is so fully developed in the New Testament that it is nothing short of astonishing that we should have gone so far astray about the whole thing. Astray about what? Divine illumination with your Bible. Everywhere amongst conservatives, we find persons who are Bible taught, but not spirit taught. I learned the Bible from my grandmother, by the way. but wasn't taught the Bible until the Holy Spirit came into my life. Everywhere amongst conservatives, we find persons that are Bible taught, but not spirit taught. They conceive truth to be something which they can grasp with the mind. If a man holds to the fundamentals of the Christian faith, he is thought to possess divine truth. But it does not follow. There is no truth apart from the Spirit. There is no truth apart from the Spirit. There is no truth 
apart from the Spirit. That's why Jesus said, it's to my advantage that I go so that you can get the Holy Spirit, and then he'll teach you. Are you tracking with me? I know you're nervous a little. Hold on, hold on. It's not bad. Are you dogging the Bible? I'm not dogging the Bible at all. But the Bible without the Holy Spirit will get you nowhere in your brain or your heart. He goes on. The most brilliant intellect may be, somebody help me with that word, imbecilic. Uh, By the way, I am that. Just so you know. I'm an imbecile without the Holy Spirit. The most brilliant intellect may be imbecilic when confronted with the mysteries of God. For a man to understand revealed truth requires an act of God equal to equal to the original act which inspired the text. Conservative Christians in this day are stumbling over this truth. We need to re-examine the whole thing. We need to learn that truth consists not in Doctrine. Truth consists not in correct doctrine, but in correct doctrine plus, plus the inward enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. We must declare again the mystery of wisdom from above. A re-preachment of this vital truth could result in a fresh breath from God upon a stale and suffocating Grace Church. Did you just say Grace Church is suffocating? I don't know. I do know without the Holy Spirit, you can say whatever you want to say about the Bible, you can say whatever you want to believe about whatever, but without the Holy Spirit, it's dry. Tozer said that 65 years ago about the church in America. Everybody's got the right verse, the right perspective, and we memorized it, we joined it, so we must be fine. Are you glowing like Moses? Are you deeply in love with Jesus? Do you understand why he gave you another helper? When their world and our world is so completely upside down. My pastor, and I told you earlier, I've had five, but my current pastor is Ed Taylor. He said this about Tozer. He said, Lord, help me to heed this reminder that even your inspired text, even your inspired text, the Bible, is not alive until the Holy Spirit takes it, enlightens the recipients. May the Holy Spirit indeed take what I teach and embed it into the hearts and minds of my hearers. Well, Pastor Bill, you just have to convince us. No, I don't. I just need to tell you what it says. The Holy Spirit has to bring it to life in you. What should we be doing? You should be praying. Matter of fact, can I pray right now? Father, I pray that you would send a fresh breath of the Holy Spirit into my heart, into the hearts of my friends here, people watching, people on radio. I pray that the Holy Spirit, our new best friend, would come with his enlightenment. His inspiration. His fragrance. His thoughts and the way he speaks to us, Lord, in our soul. And that the words we read, especially the words we're about to read, would be brought to life by the Spirit of truth himself. How I pray that we would be able to receive your love letter today, Lord. And that we would leave here more in love with Jesus, more in love with our best friend, our faces manifesting that glow. For the glory of Jesus and God's people would say, it really is a love letter. Well, I just feel condemned all the time when I read it. Well, then you need to come to Jesus and you need the filling of the Holy Spirit. 
Well, I just need it to balance the checkbook. Well, you can balance your checkbook. I mean, there's principles there, but that's not the purpose of it. Well, I need it to know how to raise my kids. Well, there's principles there. You need that, but that's not the purpose. My marriage is falling apart. Well, welcome to everybody's marriage. We need Jesus, the lover of our soul. I need Jesus to be her savior, and she needs me to be Jesus saving me. And then the Holy Spirit that, man, we're just having the best honeymoon after 45 years, right, sweetie? 45 years. You say, how'd that happen? It's the helper. It's the helper. And we get up, you know, and we think we got it. My mind comprehends it. I'll read it. I'll check off the box. And then we wonder why we're mad at everybody. Why we're so frustrated. You see, God left us here not to be frustrated. He left us here to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be a witness. You know that, right? But we just got to go save everybody. You're right, but we can't save anybody. Saving them from what? Jesus came to save us from hell. He put you right at that job you don't like. You don't like the job. You don't like punching in. You don't like anything about your boss. And you just want to punch out. Well, guess what? God orchestrated all of that so that you filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're punching in, you can do that to be a witness to whoever you're just so mad at. Well, I don't want to. I know you don't want to. That's why God gave you the Holy Spirit so that you can be a little glow worm kind of thing and that you can go there and then he's looking at you and you say, Pastor Bill, you're just making this up. No, I, it's actually the next point. I'm not making it up. The Holy Spirit, our new best friend, is our partner in wis- witnessing. He's our partner. Chapter 15, verse 26. Chapter 15, Jesus says this, But when the Holy Spirit, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, second time, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. The Holy Spirit will tell everybody he's going to testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So what do you say? No, see, the Holy Spirit, our best friend, never leaves us. Matter of fact, he's going to come to testify about Jesus to everyone. And you say, well, how's he going to do that? Well, he's going to be in you. And so that when you're lit up with the Holy Spirit and you're so in love with Jesus, that when you're there and he just wants to dog you and make fun of you and all that kind of stuff, that somehow you can still respond in love. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. And so when you get there, everybody else wants to burn that buddy. Burn him. The Holy Spirit will say, just love him. I don't want to love him. I know that's why you need a new filling. Hang out with Jesus some more and realize that Jesus loved you while you were still an enemy of his. Well, you don't expect me. Well, you can't do that in your flesh. You can't even do that with your Bible. But in a relationship with Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and your Bible, you have no idea what you can do. Because it's not really you, it's him. And it's not him all by himself because he's with you in ministry, in witnessing, in life. I don't know what to do. I never knew what to do. I never knew what to do, except I fell in love with my Bible because I got this love letter from God. And he tells me to go to Bible college. I don't want to go to Bible college. I only went to Bible college for one reason, to find out more about the one who loved me. That's why I went. Then I got there and they wanted me to preach and all this stuff. I, I don't want to do that. By the way, you don't get everything you want. The Holy Spirit takes you in stages. I sure don't want to witness. I don't want to, I don't even know what to say. Well, I know you don't want to say because that's why it's up to the Holy Spirit. When you get there, just trust him. He's going to bear witness of Jesus. And then he's going to be a partner with you. And you get out there and you say, well, I don't even know what to do. Well, just talk to somebody. I mean, I have to get the mail. So I go out to my mailbox and then my neighbor has to get the mail right next to mine. Just talk to him. I don't know what to say. I know that. Trust the Holy Spirit. He can talk to you when he wants to talk to you. It, it might go like this. How are you doing? And then all of a sudden, your neighbor just tells you this whole story. Ah, I really wanted you to tell me I'm okay. But you told me this. Ah. And you're, you're thinking, you know, I really had something else to do, but you're going on and on and on. Just, how are you doing? And then while that's happening, the Holy Spirit starts telling you, hey, ask him this, ask him that. See if, you, if he would let you pray with him. 
I didn't sign up to pray with my neighbor. Well, I know you didn't, but you've got a neighbor, and then the Holy Spirit's going to tell you to do that. Well, not during the Super Bowl. You never know. See, you have a partner. Your new best friend is, is a partner in life, and he's going to take you places. He's going to wake you up in the middle of the night. He's going to do stuff that you never expected. I literally asked my neighbor. He's been my neighbor for seven years. And I caught him in the alley. I'm just driving in and just, hey, how's it going? He said, my dad just died. When did your dad die? Sunday. How old was your dad? 62. What did he die of? Diabetes. COVID. Can I pray with you? I didn't plan on praying with my neighbor. But I could hear the Holy Spirit. And of course my neighbor said, you can pray with me. So you have no idea what God wants to do with your new best friend and you partnering together. For There's people messed up everywhere. They're your neighbors. You work with them. You go to church with them. And we keep running around trying to fix everybody with all these Bible verses we have. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, if they don't have the Holy Spirit, they ain't going to fix anything. But if you have the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, whoo, you have no idea what that means. I've got it written down. I got it fired up by the Spirit of God and truth. You have no idea what that means. You might even go to Bible college and they'll tell you, you'll never be a preacher. Don't tell God. Because he might take a fool like me and 50 years after somebody told me that, hey, God, don't tell anybody that he said I would never. And God said, I picked the foolish things. And so what I didn't know when that was told me, I didn't know about the Holy Spirit, that he's the one that gives you. He puts stuff in my brain when I'm standing here after studying all week long for this sermon. What is that? That's a living relationship with the spirit of truth who wants to illuminate my mind and yours with the word of God. But without it, you're just in a dead book going nowhere, frustrated. But with the Holy Spirit, that's what Tozer was getting at. How much we need the illumination, the inspiration, the enlightenment for this brain to even start to comprehend what this blessed book says to us about the love of God. And that we should love people that same way. Now I'm looking at a whole bunch of people saying, I can't love like Jesus. I know you can't. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit's love. And then over time, you end up looking more like Jesus than you did before. Plus, he's the secret agent. What? No, the Holy Spirit's the secret agent. We saw this last week. Look at what it says. So he comes down through all of this. And, and then we saw last week in chapter 16 and verse 8, chapter 16, verse 8. Not only is he our new best friend who teaches us, but he's the sick, secret agent that convicts the world. So chapter 16, verse 8, we saw last week where, uh, let me find the verse. And when he has come, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world. The Holy Spirit's going to convict the world. He's going to expose. He's going to refute. He's going to convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. By the way, the Holy Spirit comes to seal us. The Holy Spirit comes to empower us. The Holy Spirit comes to enlighten us. But you also need to know the Holy Spirit comes to convict people, to convince people, to haunt them down. Did you say haunt? I said haunt them down. 
No, why would he do that? That's part of his job. So, hey, praise God for us. He illuminates us. For others, he convicts them. He convinces them. He rebukes them. He reinforces to them the truth about Jesus. That's what he does. And you say, no, I've been talking to that guy at work, and he doesn't get it. He's never going to listen to me. Well, he doesn't have to listen to you. He can't get away from the Holy Spirit. No, he flipped me off and he went home. Well, all right, but guess who went home with him? The Holy Spirit. (laughs) So when you go home at night and you open your Bible and you have a brief time with the Lord and you go to bed happy, I don't know. Guys, the goal is that we should go to bed happy. Like, the Lord's got this. He's coming soon. Thank you, Lord. Hey, the dude you witnessed to that said no to Jesus, guess what he's got? He's got to drink whatever to try to fall asleep. And the Holy Spirit said, he's right. What you heard, he's right. And that guy's going like, what's going on? That's the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit can do that right now while you're sitting there. And you're saying, this guy's lost it. And then the Holy Spirit comes along and says, he's right. You know it. You're all alone. He's the secret agent to the world. They don't even know. They don't even know. And he has a way, when I say nagging them, he has a way of wooing them and sometimes nagging. And they can say no. They can say no. But now they're responsible for saying no to the gospel, to the very Holy Spirit that was talking to them. What does that have to do with you? We're just a witness. I don't, have to, I don't have to convince anybody. Did you know that? Can I say the quote by John Corson? Truly, it's not by excellent arguments or sermons, argumentation, or through a powerful presentation that the light goes on and the heart opens up. It's only by the work of the Spirit that people who are blind begin to see. So if he's our new best friend, it's to our advantage that Jesus left so that the Holy Spirit can come. And he's a secret agent. Oh, but watch what happens on a personal level. He's our personal mentor. Verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 12. Chapter 16, verse 12. He's our personal mentor. When I use the word mentor, I want to be really careful. The definition for mentor. A wise and trusted guide and advisor. The Holy Spirit is a wise and trusted guide. Can I hear you say guide? Yeah. An advisor. You say, well, I just want him to zap me, and so I have all this right off the... It, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. He's going to guide you. He knows where you're at. He knows how much you can handle. Amen. Notice Jesus talking to the disciples. He actually brings that up. The promise of further revelation... And he has that right there in verse 12. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you. These are to the 11 disciples. I have many things to say to you. There's a whole bunch I want to tell you about me. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Well, I just want to know everything I should know about Jesus. You can't bear that now. You can't handle it. You see, my God... Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus knows how much I can handle. And in the heart of Jesus, he wants us to know so much more about him. But he looks at those disciples and says, I know you can't handle it right now. Matter of fact, they're on information overload. You guys know what that is, right? Information overload. We all have that problem today. We get bombarded with information. Some of you might be on your cell phone right now watching a YouTube. Shame on you. That's information (laughs) overload. And we want the answer about everything. And so we're looking for all this stuff everywhere. It's right there. And Jesus says, you can't handle it. I want to tell you more. I'll give it to you in doses. The Holy Spirit's going to teach you. But you can't handle all the truth about me. You can't. There's many things I want you to know, but you can't. Bible knowledge commentary. Remember where these guys are at. The disciples were not able to receive any more spiritual truth at the time. Their hearts were hardened. Their concern was for their own preeminence in an earthly kingdom. So they saw no need for Jesus' death. Sorrow over his departure. Dismay over the prophecy of a traitor amongst them. Along with the prediction of their own desertion. 
rendered them insensitive to more spiritual truth. In other words, they're not in a good place to get any more information because they're in shock. What's going on in the country? Politics, Rome, taxes, life. And that's the truth. So Jesus says, I've got so much more to tell you about me. But you can't handle it right now. But the Holy Spirit will tell you when you can handle it. That's why a personal mentor, he knows what you're going through. He knows about your marriage. He knows about your job. He knows about the economy. He knows about COVID. Aren't you glad he knows? He gave us a new best friend. Not to ignore all that stuff, but to know what we're supposed to be in the middle of that stuff. What do you want us to be? Our faces should be glow with the glory of God. In love with the one who died for us. Because the world doesn't have that. They don't have that at all. How are they going to get that? Well, you've got to get it first. You have to get it first. The spirit of truth. Watch this, verse 13. This is where I'm going to slow down. Verse 13. However, when he, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, third time we've seen that this morning. When the spirit of truth, he's not going to fool you. He's not a spirit of lie. He's always going to tell you the truth. When he has come, he will guide you into all truth. Can I hear you say all truth? For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, whatever the Holy Spirit hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. And we read that and we think the Holy Spirit's going to guide us into all truth. That's not what it says. It doesn't say that. You said, I'm looking at my Bible. That's exactly what it says. No, it doesn't. In the Greek, you have to go back to the Greek. In our Bibles, they left out the definite uh, article. Jesus says the Holy Spirit's going to lead you into the truth. The truth. The truth. Not all truth. Your Bibles doesn't, does not contain all truth. Does, does your Bibles talk about microbes, by the way? Have you ever read microbes in your Bible? No. Did you know microbes are true? They live in your gut. You have billions of them down there figuring all that stuff. The Bible never talks about that. Did you know the Bible never talks about uh, nuclear fusion or fission? Well, it's true. Well, I know it's true. So is plutonium. Go talk to Mike about Pantex or something. But it's not your Bible. Well, I thought all truth. No, no, no. Your Bible is true about the truth. Your Bible is true about the truth. Well, what's the truth? (laughs) Jesus. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit's not going to tell you anything on his own authority. The Holy Spirit's going to tell you the truth about me. And I want to tell you, but you can't handle it right now. So the Holy Spirit's going to come and give you more and more and more. He's going to give the truth that you can handle. And it's all going to be written down. But then he's going to have to illuminate your mind and your heart. And then you're going to see things you've never seen before because it's not just about your brain. It's about your heart and the Holy Spirit that takes this living word and brings it to life in you. And then you just think, I didn't know it would be like this. I know you didn't. But Jesus wants you to have that. Jesus wants you to have that. That's why it's written down. That's why you have a copy. But that'll just be a dry book on your coffee table until you understand it's a love letter and I need the Holy Spirit to lighten it up. We just need, to, Lord, I just need the Holy Spirit. I need my best friend to bring it to life to me. Even while I'm preaching right here to you. When that starts clicking, all of a sudden you go, hey, hey, hey. Well, it tells me I'll know all these things to come. You're going to know all the things to come concerning Jesus. You'll know everything you need to know about Jesus. I just want to know the chart, like what's going to happen next. Well, the kingdom of God's within, but the kingdom of God is coming. Can I hear an amen? Amen. When will that be? Well, it's going to happen soon. I don't know the day or the hour, but it's going to come. I know that because of what Jesus told me. And then when you get to the end of the story, new heaven, new earth, and then we're with God forever and ever and ever. Revelation 21, 3, that's like the end game. Can I hear an amen? Until we get then, it will not be boring. It will not be boring. But the main thing about the book is not for you to have the right chart. The main thing about the book is for you to be in love with the one who wrote it. I could ask it this way. How are you doing with the love letter from God? How are you doing 
with the one who loves you so much? How are you? How much of you is in love with Jesus? You say, where'd you get that? Ooh, last point. Last point. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you. He's going to guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears from the Father, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. He, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, he will glorify me. The Holy Spirit will glorify me. The Holy Spirit's going to glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare. He will declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he, the Holy Spirit, will take of mine and declare it to you. Well, Jesus, you're making it sound like this is all about you. It is all about me. It's all about me. And the Holy Spirit is out to glorify me. And when you take your Bible given to us by direct inspiration, preserved for us through 2,000 years, and you take every part of this Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then you'll find the Holy Spirit saying, hey, I want you to know about Jesus. I want to glorify Jesus. I want, to, I want you to know what is mine, mine, mine of Jesus. I'll declare it to you. I'll declare it to you. I'm going to show you Jesus on every page. You know, the, you know the problem of glory, right? That, that's what Moses wanted to see, remember? I just want to see your glory. And God said, well, <laughs> technically I'll let you see my back. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and you can see my back. Or I'll meet you in the tent and your face will glow. But I don't mean, I want to see the glory of God. I want to see the glory of Jesus. You say, well, what? Like light it up, we'd all be dead. Oh, unless it's through the word of God and the Holy Spirit. That his job is to glorify Jesus, declare unto us, declare unto us, declare unto us all the things about Jesus that we need as a personal mentor. I, I need that. Just tell me more and more and more. And then as you spend, spend time with the Lord Jesus and his word and the Holy Spirit, and then you're out in this minute, as you go down through time, you'll love him more. Now, if you don't love Jesus more, it's because you're not seeing his glory. Somehow you're not seeing his glory because... When he's glorified, you will love him more. You say, what are you talking about? Well, it's like when I met Cindy. Okay, when I met Cindy at the Get Acquainted Banquet at ABI, you know why I was attracted to her? The pants that she had on. They were unbelievable. I still remember those pants. And you say, no, I'm just being honest with you. She was like, wow, I need to get to know her. So it took me like, what, two minutes before I'm over there, you know, taking pictures, not of her. I was the photographer of the yearbook or whatever, but I used that as an excuse to get right over next to her. Like, hey, baby, what are you doing? I didn't say that at Bible college. <laughs> <laughs> but of course I wanted, well, why did you want to get to know her? Well, because she's good looking. So what'd you do? It wasn't very much longer. I took a picture of her. I still got that picture. I got a picture of my wallet of her. I go, why do you have that? Well, because, well, that's what attracted me to her. But that's not when I fell in love with her. See, as I spent time with Cindy, and then I heard the way she thinks, and then I saw the way she's gifted, and her character, her character, who she is. What was attracting to me, all of a sudden, Turned it. I started to see her glory. The word glory means weight, weight, substance. And so there's a lot of girls at Bible college, and all they got is a pair of pants. But when you see somebody's glory, And you put that over time. Can I see the picture of my bride? Now, if you don't know my wife, you only see a scarf and blonde hair. But if you know my Cindy, 
if you know her glory. Then I'm in love. Not a love of 45 years ago, not a love of four years ago. I'm talking a love as I watch her glory. Now, she's not Jesus. Oh, I got some other stories I can tell you. <laughs> and I'm not Jesus. I'm just saying when glory is revealed to you and you understand by the power of the Spirit, the glory, you'll love them. That you understand the Spirit's not to speak on his own initiative, but the things of Christ, you'll love them. That all of a sudden your Bible's not just a book of commandments or do this or get burned. No, your Bible is a love letter. I got burned for you. So that you could be free to live in a time like this in our country. And to glow. Because you hung out with your best friend in the tent. This tent. This tent. That when I go out... You bet. I want to talk to my neighbors. You bet. I want to be the best guy at Walmart. That's hard, by the way. I want to be the best guy at Walmart. (laughs) You know, and I want to drive my car in a way that pleases my father. And then he has a way of keeping me accountable for that. Right? I want to hold my tongue. What's happening? Glory. His glory. By the Holy Spirit, the advantage we have with him. Amen? Amen. I pray we all leave here glowing more with the love of God than when we came. That you find your Bible, the greatest love letter ever, as God continues to illuminate you concerning Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your word today. It's your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that brings it to life. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that work that we pray we would take more advantage of that. Thank you for your indwelling. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your power. Thank you for being our best friend. Help us to hear your voice, never to grieve you, I pray. Lord, I thank you that as we learn more about our Savior, and you know how much we can handle, I pray that like Moses, we would just delight ourselves in face-to-face friendship with you. I do pray for the marriages. I pray for the parenting. I pray for our responsibility, Lord, in Amarillo, Texas that we would know how to look like Jesus in a world going crazy. I pray for my neighbor special. I ask that you would bless him, Lord. Help me to be his friend and a good neighbor to Jeremy, I pray. Could be you're here today and that thing about the Holy Spirit in you, like that's never happened to you. Or that have, Jesus has a way of showing up and knocking on the door of your heart. He does. And you've never cared less about the Bible, let alone that it's a love letter. And yet somehow the Holy Spirit's talking to you. Convincing you, convicting you, rebuking you that you need Jesus. You just need Jesus. And then we get to decide, yes or no. I would plead with you, say yes to Jesus. He wants to change your life completely. That's why he died. He loves you. He loves you. He knows everything you've done. And yet he died for every one of those sins. If that's you today, then you just sense, I I just, it's like I have to make a decision. Well, It's like the ones in first service. I'm going to ask you to stand up. If you're here today and you just want to say yes to Jesus, you want to believe in the gospel, you want to be connected to the Holy Spirit, 
All those things. That just by standing, that's going to be an act of faith and obedience. And I'm going to pray. And guess what? I don't trust my prayer. I don't trust you standing. I trust the Holy Spirit that was able to save me in 1972 and has never let me go. Never. With the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's who I trust. But I did receive it. So I'm giving you that opportunity. If you're here this morning, that by standing, you're saying yes to Jesus. Yes to the gospel. Is there anybody here today before I close in prayer? Thank you, sister. Thank you, sister. Thank you, sister. Thank you guys over here. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, sister back there. Thank you, sister. Father, I thank you for ones that are listening to the Holy Spirit. Not words that I said, but words that you meant. The very word of God with the spirit of truth. I trust you that you'll take these ones that are standing. There might be some still sitting. There might be guys out there, Lord, on internet or radio. You know the heart when we finally say yes to Jesus. So bless them, Lord. I pray they would be surprised at how the Bible sounds, the way it speaks to us, the way it sings to us. I pray their heart would be receptive, Lord, not only for the encouragement, but then the conviction and things that you'll speak to them. That together we'll just rejoice. I pray a, a fresh breath of your spirit, Lord, in my life, in our life, that we would not be a suffocating church, but one on fire for you until you come so soon. And that Jesus, only Jesus would receive the honor and glory. And all of God's people would say, Amen. you guys want to thank all these ones that are standing and what the Lord's going to do? Oh, P.S. I love you guys. I love you.